You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only. Hello, this is Eric Topol uh, with Medscape Medicine and the Machine podcast, and we have a new episode today with a really interesting fellow physician, Dr. Adam Rodman. I'll tell you a little bit about him before we uh, welcome him. He's an internist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He's an educator and instructor at Harvard Medical School, recent author of the book Shortcuts Medicine, and he has a podcast, Bedside Rounds. And I didn't know Adam, but um, he had two successive New England Journal articles, 3rd of August, and the 10th of August, which we'll link with the podcast, on AI in medicine. So with that background, Adam, welcome. Thank you, Eric. I, uh, I read your book years ago. Uh, great book. So very, this is like a little starstruck to be talking to you. Well, you're very kind. And, you know, you've been really lightening it up lately. And so that's why you and the Medicine and the Machine podcast were made for each other. Actually, really. Um, so... Before I get into um, education, which is something that you're really leading the charge, how to change education, I thought we would get going with um, where we stand with the large language models, chat GPT, GPT-4, imminent, Gemini, many others that are out there already, and how you see these getting rooted in the daily practice of medicine. Uh, you know, we saw early on about the U.S. medical licensing exam. There's kind of a lot of hooey or hype. But then we got to patient questions, front door for the doctor, and clinical reasoning and making diagnoses and stuff like that. So what's your vision of how this gets laid out over time? Uh, so very exciting question. So uh, other than education, I do clinical reasoning research. Um, so I, I think there's a, a couple domains. I'm sure you saw the preprint that was recently out of Stanford looking at summarization of documents. So I think a lot of the near-term things we're going to see, we generate a lot of text. A lot of, uh, we have to summarize a lot of text. We have to handle a lot of text. My job as an internist is obviously collecting information from patients and building relationships, but it's also absorbing a lot of information that's stored in the chart. And I think a lot of the near-term uses that we're seeing, and this is what people are building right now, and the feasibility is going to be at text summarization. Now, what you're mentioning is clinical reasoning. This is really exciting. So a lot of these older studies on clinical reasoning were done on the MedQA database um, for benchmarking studies, or um, we've seen like the USMLE questions or USMLE style questions. Uh, what my research has been is to think a little bit more uh, in depth about what it means for an LLM to show clinical reasoning or to uh, act as uh, clinical decision support, CDS. And that's something that doctors have been doing for, this is what happens when you get a historian, right? We've actually been thinking about this since the 1950s. Uh, we haven't had to take it too seriously until, you know, a year ago. One of, one of the uh, examples I like to talk about is between about, let's say, 1995 and 2019, there were about 15 uh, papers evaluating CDS uh, for diagnostics. And in the last six months, there have been four times that number of papers. So clearly interest has exploded. And the reason why this is so exciting is if you look from a cognitive psychology standpoint on how doctors make clinical reasoning decisions, um, it has a lot to do with words. It has to do a lot with, um, this is script theory, with semantics, and this understanding that our internal map of diseases and disease processes is mapped out in associations between these different uh, semantic qualities. So for example, is this person having acute shortness of breath? Is it more subacute on chronic? Is it waxing and waning? Um, how does that link to other understandings about the disease? And it just so happens that because of how large language models work, they certainly do not work the same way the human mind works, but they kind of create a simulacra with how we understand that humans make decisions. And that's what the that's what the evidence is starting to show. Even with these general purpose models, they appear to make medical decisions or at least diagnoses equivalent or even better than humans in very specific experimental situations. But it's something, again, it's something we haven't dealt with before in the long history of uh, uh, clinical decision support. Um, well, did I answer your question? I, I, I got to it. You yeah, know, I think, well, hopefully everybody uh, is up on clinical decision support, as you said, CDS, 
and how that's been evolving, whereas before it was kind of heuristic, primitive algorithms, and now it's starting to get multimodal with the foundation models. So it's much more sophisticated than it was. It used to be kind of a bad term where, oh, no, I don't want that decision support in the electronic record because it's, it's so stupid or unhelpful. And now, you know, maybe it has a chance to really uh, make a difference. But it, it reminds me of a, a classic paper that um, Jerry Jerome Groupman wrote in The New Yorker about it. How do doctors think? And I think he even he wrote the book. It's a great uh, book. And then he, and then he wrote a book about it. That's right. And so when you wrote in the third August New England Journal, throughout history, technology has disrupted the way physicians think. Can you elaborate on that? Because um, history, you're going back to you know Hippocrates here. Where are you going on that? Well, I don't know how much you want me to go in depth. I, I'll scope it with modern medicine. So. Um, one of the biggest, so I think in my piece, I draw two examples. One is the physical exam or I think pathological anatomy. And the second is the electronic health record. So if you go back to the beginnings of what we, what we generally consider modern medicine. So this is like Paris in the late 19th, uh, sorry, late 18th, early 19th century. Um, you have these nascent ideas out there that people, that disease, like when somebody dies, you can do an autopsy and you can figure out that there are different changes in the body. Like Morgani is the classic guy because he's Italian. But, you know, he would have his patients, they would die, cut them open, and he'd say, oh, look, there's actually a bunch of cheesy material in the lungs. Uh, that's weird. Maybe that's why he was short of breath before this. And then in this, like, really post-revolutionary France, there's this movement of doctors who start to experiment um, of seeing, of doing what we would now call diagnostic tests. The first was just percussion. So percussion to see where fluid is and percussion of the body cavities. And then you have this guy, Rene Lineck, who uh, he, he's a musician and he used on his lathe, he turns a wooden cylinder and experiments and he invents the first stethoscope. So you have this idea, the exam that you can pick up disease on the inside of the human body. And the, this, these changes happened over a generation, but it was absolutely fundamental to our understanding of what disease is and what the role of the doctor is. We take our role as disease detective for granted now, but the entire idea that we would have to like, investigate to find the source of disease rather than being self-evident is predicated on you know this idea that we can use tests to figure things out. This whole idea of collecting data, of clinical data. I mean, um, I'm my hair's going gray, but I, if you go back like a generation, no one would have used the phrase clinical data. We would have talked about like facts of disease. This idea that there's data out there to collect and curate and use that to find things about the patient. All of that kind of tracks back to this development of this tool of, of diagnostics of the physical exam. And then the, the second big change that I talk about in the paper, and of course this is oversimplifying, is the electronic health record. And the EHR, uh, I think most people generally have a sense that the EHR came out of the informatics movement, is actually fundamentally tied in with, the, uh, with our understanding of artificial intelligence. If you look at Larry Weed, who uh, developed the idea of the problem-oriented medical record, as well as the soap note, right? We all write soap note. Well, it was invented by Larry Weed. He had this idea from the very beginning that physicians need to collect, curate information so that computers could like read it and make better decisions. Um, and that really has influenced the way that our EHR worked. Um, a few generations of, of doctors ago, your progress notes would be super short. They'd say things like, well, the patient was sleeping, they're feeling better. Oh no, they had a fever. I had to start ampicillin. Um, and then progress notes now, because of this idea, are very, very long. Um, unfortunately for Larry Weed, and he had a lot of regret towards the end of his life, like the the idea of us as being data curators came to pass, but the CDS, the, the AI that would take better care of patients did not. Um, so, so like we've kind of reframed the way we think about our jobs because of these technologies. I, I hit that. That's one of the things that makes you unique because you're, a historian of medicine, and you're also really, in many ways, a futurist. Now, that's pretty interesting because, you know, not many people that are spanning both of those uh, roles. Now, um, so you've really made a, a a good case for how this can revolutionize or, you know, transform clinical reasoning. It's like another chapter. And the other thing you touched on, which I thought was really interesting, well over 200 years ago when Lenneck invented the stethoscope, which obviously became 
a, a pivotal tool for physicians. As you know, as a history uh, medicine expert, there was a war against the festival yes. stethoscope for decades. No, I don't want this. It's going to interfere with my patient, uh, you know, visit and, and bonding, and I don't, I don't want to learn these sounds, and you know. So we're we're kind of seeing that yet again. I mean, there's a lot of physicians out there who are very, very skeptical, very uh, worried about AI. So can you address that? Is there a, is there a parallel with the stethoscope and these other changes that occurred? A hundred percent. And you're you're so right. I actually found I did a, a research study on the death exam, and in the 1890s, there are still not in France, but in the UK, people are still poo pooing the stethoscope. And that's you know that's like 70. That's four generations of doctors later. Um, so yeah, uh, these. Uh, this is going to be getting very like post-structuralist, but this idea of an episteme, right? This idea that knowledge is bounded by certain acceptable ways of, of accessing information. And the stethoscope was a challenge because prior to this like pathological anatomy, it, it, it's a whole different way of thinking, right? Physicians would have said, well, I just talk to the patient and then I fit them into a bucket and that's all I need to do. It was totally reframing the entire way they thought about disease to have to investigate and people push back against that. I think we're seeing something similar with large language models. And I have sympathy for people who are skeptical because, well, for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of hype out there, right? Uh, Martin Shkreli like, said, oh, I've invented a, a LLM that's going to replace doctors. And I want to reassure everybody that's not, that's not happening anytime soon. So I understand that there's a lot of people who want to sell something to you who are perhaps overhyping. And there have been hyped technologies in the past that have not panned out. We're learning more every single day what their specific uses and specific misuses are, and they perform. So what I would say is to people who are skeptical is, like, seriously engage with it. Go to a conference where people are using it. Actually try it yourself and take, you know, take 30 minutes in becoming proficient and using it. And I think it will, like, at the beginning, you're like, this changes everything. And you'll be super excited. And then as you use it more, you'll realize that there are uses and limitations, but you'll still understand how how useful and potentially transformative a technology is. Right, for medicine. And so with specialized fine tuning and, you know, building on the, that construct, we'll see, you know, things that are far better. But what you wrote in the 3rd August New England Journal, if we don't shape our own future, powerful technology companies will happily shape it for us. That's, that's a pretty important point. Can you uh, back that one up? Yes. Uh, so I, I would draw parallels to the EHR. Um, when the EHR was developed, really even into the 90s, this is going to sound shocking, doctors loved it. You read people's experiences and they're like, it's making me smarter. It's making me take better care of my patients. I'm spending more time with my patients. So the EHR used to be something that doctors were looking forward to, like Star Trek future. And now I would say that I bet a lot of the listeners here are miserable using the EHR. What happened? Clinicians didn't continue to drive it for the needs for our uses, which is mostly, you know, it's taking care of patients and um, communicating. And it got taken over by large, larger corporate concerns who were more interested with money rather than usability. Uh, I, the reason I'm so, like, I'm working basically two full-time jobs these days. And the reason I'm so fired up about this is I see this transition, right? I see that if clinicians and patients and uh, people who are interested drive this technology in the right way, we could have a technology that that brings us to like the, the sick bay on the enterprise, right? Where I spend more time with my patient, but I have someone looking over me, giving me advice when I need it. It helps me strengthen those relationships that matter with my patients. I also see that these tools could be used to extract even more efficiency and money out of a beleaguered healthcare system. Of course they can. Um, they're very powerful. So that, that's what I mean. And I shouldn't say it's not like the tech companies are evil. No, they're not evil. They're creating a very powerful tool. I just worry in our healthcare environment, who's going to be driving this forward? And I mean, selfishly, I want it to be us and our patients. Well, on that score, you know, last week, which is representative of many other stories like this, there was a, a case of a, of a young boy uh, named Alex, and he had... Uh, a lot of symptoms of pain and growth arrest, development arrest, uh, you know, all sorts of things going wrong in his life. And he, he, he was seen by 17 different doctors and a dentist over three years, had extensive workups, many times repeated tests that were done along the way. 
no diagnosis. Whatever diagnosis he had proved to be wrong. His mother goes into ChatGPT and immediately, by putting in the symptoms one night, gets the diagnosis. Um, a, it's tethered cult- cord, right? Tethered cord? Yeah, spina, di- by spina diffida, bifida. And, and then he has surgery to untether his cord to his uh, coccyx, and he's like normal, perfectly cured through ChatGPT. Nothing to do with clinicians, bypassing clinicians in spite of clinicians. So while you have written a lot about uh, um, and thinking a lot about the clinical community getting up to speed, which obviously it isn't yet because all of this is happening at a velocity we've never seen, what about the patient side? Yeah. And this is what excites me. Uh, we have open notes now, right? That's federal law. Those notes are, I mean, my goodness, they're inaccurate. They include inaccuracies. They're full of jargon. They're overwhelming. You can easily imagine, even right now, with GPT-4 as it is right now, that a patient could, I, this technical, but you could imagine like a custom embedding of their own chart that would allow a patient to talk to their own chart and, and get a deeper understanding of what's going on and maybe even see inaccuracies and participate more in their own care. Um, LL, I mean, I think uh, this is controversial, but I think in the not so distant future, LLMs are going to be doing the first part of some of these diagnoses of helping to triage patients in a way that might actually be more patient friendly because they have infinite patients. Um, they, as, as you mentioned in that JAMA IM study, they are uh, seen as more empathetic. Uh, they, we haven't tested this, it needs to be tested, but they may be able to do better things. Like you may be able to take a sexual history much better than a human because you know you're talking to a computer. So I, on both sides, both with involving patients more in their own care, as well as helping clinicians take better care of patients, I see lots of opportunity. Now, with all this background, how do we get medical students and physicians who are in practice up to speed? Because Obviously, they have no one. No one has had the background. In fact, we still don't even fully understand how these new models work. But how do we get this happening? Because I, I think you're right. If we don't do this within the medical community, if we don't take ownership and and uh, you know a a real purposeful um, guidance force for it being done properly, uh, we're in for some trouble. And I just noted in recent days. Uh, University of Texas San Antonio just uh, started a combined program for their medical school for medical students to get an MD degree and an MS degree in AI. And as and at your medical school at Harvard, they started a PhD in AI and medicine, which is really interesting. So those are the only two programs that have been announced, and those are formal programs for people, young people, in training. How are we going to get this education mission going? Yeah. And I, I will also say that our uh, our new dean of education, Bernard Chang at, at Harvard, wrote a piece in JAMA just last week, giving his view for what uh, what undergraduate medical education should look like in the world of large language models. And it's what we're talking about, is preparing people to work with machines, not not as a replacement, but to work well together. Uh, to get to your question, this is an active area of debate, right? There are some people out there. I, I'm just going to acknowledge that the community is split. Because there are some people out there who says doctors need to become more proficient with data science. We need to understand how data science works so that we can have this two-way communication with data scientists to make things better. I, I'm not sure about that because if you look at like electronic health records, I don't think anyone, like that's not a core competency of being a doctor. So my general approach has been to think of large language models as technological tools in the way that other, like we don't need to understand physics in order to understand how how to interpret an MRI. I don't need to understand acoustics in order to use a stethoscope. So that's those are my biases as a historian is that I don't know that we need doctors to have in-depth knowledge about the inner workings of the technology in so, insofar as much as being proficient with working with them and understanding how they work. And the, the problem with my approach is that no one knows right now, right? We're in the very, very early days. I think everyone sees it's going to be very impactful. There are some early use cases and data is starting to come in. But if, if you were to say, how do we start an AI med school right now? No one, no one knows. So the lesson that I take, and this is what I'm trying to do in my residency, is to be open-minded, experiment, and to study and evaluate the different things that we're doing and understand that we need to get people proficient in using that. And that means practice. And that's not a very satisfying, this is the academic answer, right? I'm like, what we need is more study. But that is actually what I'm trying to do. But that gets me to another pivotal question. 
Because let's fast forward five years or so and say, hypothetically, that we have now these large language models integrated to practice, you know, in the uh, care of patients in diagnostic and clinical reasoning. Let's just say that happens, okay? Uh, and it's not done solo. It's done, you know, with oversight, human in the loop, always that. Why do we need Brainiacs for admissions to medical school with SAT or M MCAT scores, you know, at the highest level and GPAs, you know, through the roof? Why do we need a culture of Brainiacs when we have the, the cyst of machines? What, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, so by by brainiacs, I mean you imagine you you mean people who would do very well on standardized tests in the current system, right? Yeah, we don't. I mean, and, and and grade point average. That's how we select medical students. You don't even get an interview, or you don't even get to the cut line unless you have you know ex above X level GPA and MCAT scores, right? I don't think we need that right now, right? If you look at the actual cognitive work of an, in I'm an internist. Uh, you're an internist. What do I do as part of my cognitive work? Yes, I do make difficult diagnoses sometimes. What do I mostly do? I talk to people. I build their trust. I uh, communicate difficult concepts to them. I communicate with ever-expanding multidisciplinary teams. I do transitions of care. And yes, I, I document and put my thoughts on paper. Like if you actually were honest about the cognitive work of the doctor, diagnosis is a relatively small part of it. And the things that we spend most of our time doing, we get no training about in medical school. I want to challenge that um, because I think you know there's really solid documentation that there's more than 12 million serious diagnostic medical errors a year, a year. That's a lot of errors that are people getting harmed by having the wrong diagnosis or not having the diagnosis. I, mean, I should say, a diagnosis, is, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying it's a relatively small part of the, the cognitive task. We're ter I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's very important. Um, I read that study, actually, I quoted it today, and I think over half of them were just in 14 diseases, if I recall, right? So it's a relatively small, we're not messing up like lupus nephritis, we're messing up heart disease. Um, so yeah, it is, it is important. It's just a small part of, of what humans do. So to your question, what do we do when computers can do diagnosis, like working with us better than we do? I think med school focuses on a lot of the other things that make humans good doctors, and that's communication and care transitions and you know, explaining difficult concepts and you know, those, those sorts of things, because I'm hopeful, and I think you're hopeful too, that diagnostic errors will decrease dramatically and we'll be better at diagnosis and working with the computers. I mean, I, I think that's a logical conclusion. Would, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean... This was the premise of when I wrote Deep Medicine, you know, that four, five years ago was that if we use these AI tools, and we didn't have large language models back then, of course, that was just a theory. We, at some point, we were going to have them, that we would have the gift of time and we could listen to patients rather than interrupting them after 10 seconds. And we would actually, you know, have this human bond reestablished, which has become dreadful over the decades. Well, you have a situation where we could get medicine back to emphasize the trust, the presence, the, the, the empathy, the communication. This is our one big shot. Would you agree that this is our one big shot? Or do you have other ways we could get that restored? No, I agree. So that I agree with you 100%. So the reason that I'm so passionate about this is if you look at the trajectory of medicine, it has not been heading in that direction. Medicine has been more fragmented less human, more errors creeping in. And part of that is a consequence of us getting better at treating disease. But because of that, we've like industrialized medicine. We might transition to a period where diseases are defined by these large associations via neural networks that no human being can understand, but it will work. And then where does that leave us? What is the professional role of a physician? What does it mean to go to medical school and be a doctor? We don't even know what's coming, what it's going to do to our professional identity. We know something's coming. But we don't know exactly what. And because of the nature of how we founded our knowledge, I maybe we can't know. And that's scary and exciting. Yeah. And the other thing, just to get your thoughts on, is that, as you're well aware, there's a global burnout among clinicians, you know, doctors, nurses, and, you know, many other health professionals. And I wonder how much you think a part of that stems from the inability to provide care because you're squeezed with so, many, so little time with patients, you're spending a lot of time as a data clerk, uh, working on pre-authorizations and all sorts of menial tasks that you, the last thing you really want to do in your life. Um, what are your thoughts about 
that the world of AI support will make that better, that we can start to turn around a crisis? Or is that crisis truly independent of the things that might be uh, uh, modulated from technology? No, I think you're right. Uh, well, I, so burnout is multifactorial, but uh, like if you look at that time tracking study by Lena Mamakina published, Scott, at this point over, over a decade ago, residents spent less than six minutes a, a day with each of their patients, which was less time than they spent walking around or waiting for an elevator. That's like, I'm not, uh, this is not my specialty of research, but that's, that's the human eye. Like, and of course people are burnt out when you do that. And if you look at the near-term use cases of LL, like really near-term, like what we could do right now, um, referencing the study we talked about, about summarization, right now, obviously medicine highly regulated, probably a good thing, but you could probably just have GPT do a lot of our documentation or LLMs do a lot of our documentation right now, which would give us more time to spend with our patients, even if we froze technology in its place at this very moment. So I think you're right. Well, and also just for those... Um... Uh, listeners who are not up on the latest preprints that you alluded to, the summarization one was a very interesting one that just appeared because it suggested that rather than having extended conversations with a chatbot, that if you could just summarize everything, you'll get more, even more accurate answers. Um, and so that's that was a very interesting finding because the conversation, as I think you'll agree, is fun. It's fun to have this, you know, talking to this what appears to be. Uh, a fairly astute um, chatbot, uh, a machine talking back at you, but it doesn't. It 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 just gets distracted. It gets off, you know, the target of your of your what your ultimate prompt and and objective is. So that it's it's a very interesting finding, and we'll see if that gets backed up by others. I have to say, I really respect your work. I think you're you're uh, doing things, writing things, uh, doing podcasts, and of course, you're teaching at the med school and caring for patients in a way that's exemplary. And uh, I, like I said, I don't, I haven't met too many historians that are futurists. So I, I really am impressed by that. And I'm going to look towards you to help us find a way to get our medical community up to speed because we're, we're not there yet. And uh, you know, the things that you're working on, hopefully you're going to help propel us forward. So thank you, Adam. Really appreciate your, uh, you're joining us today. Oh, it was a huge honor, Eric. Uh, can't believe that I'm having this conversation with you. So thank you very much. You are listening to Medicine and the Machine with Medscape Editor-in-Chief Eric Topol and Master Storyteller and Clinician Abraham Verghese as they talk with experts around the globe about the hottest topics in healthcare. This podcast is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only.